Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's episode is brought to you in part by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative animatronics, poseable sculptures, and puppets. And you can find out more on their website at trxdinosaurs.com or on Instagram at trxdinosaurs. And I don't know if you could hear it in Garrett's voice, but Garrett was smiling very big at this intro. And that's because we just finished recording a bonus episode for our patrons in which I started the show. Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> and Garrett likes to start the show. <laughs> So this is bonus content. We're celebrating the release of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, which is coming out in a few short weeks. And for our patrons, we're rounding up all of the dinosaurs of the day that are in the books or the movies and talking about where they appear, as well as putting together the clips about the dinosaurs. So we have them all in one place. Yep. So if you're interested in getting a hold of that premium content, make sure you join us on our Patreon. Yes, at patreon.com slash inodino. We are also doing a poll on social media asking you to rank your favorite Jurassic Park, Jurassic World movies, at least the first four, because obviously we don't know about Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom yet. And then we'll be announcing it after the new movie comes out. Announcing the winner, yeah. Yes, the winner of everybody's favorite. So keep a lookout for that on our social media accounts. I have a guess of who it's going to be. I hope we can set it up to rank order them, because otherwise it's just going to be Jurassic Park. (laughs) <laughs> but second third and fourth place will be interesting yes <laughs> i have a guess about fourth place too yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> so in this episode we have a dinosaur of the day monolophosaurus and we have a bunch of dinosaur news but before we get into all of that news and our dinosaur of the day we would like to thank some of our stegosaurus patrons and this week we would like to thank scotty jackson Megan Dixon, Kessler, Tristan Jules, Grandpa Dino, Rhinosaurus, Morgan Eklov, and Dr. Eigenbot. Yay, thanks everybody. We really appreciate you. Yep, and hopefully you enjoy the premium content that we made for all of our patrons. Yes, <laughs> and once again, if you want to get in on that, check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. Jumping into the news, we've got a new baby dinosaur specimen. And it's not a new genus, but it is a new specimen. Mm. It's almost a new genus. It just missed it by a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> so this was published in the Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society by Rodrigo Mueller and others. And what they did was they found a new specimen of Buriolestes, which is a very old dinosaur. And the specimen is also very old, even for a dinosaur. <laughs> It's about 231 million years old. Wow. Yeah, putting it kind of near the beginning of the end of the Triassic because there weren't really dinosaurs in the early Triassic. It's like end of the middle Triassic is when we see the very first dinosaurs. So this is just maybe 10 million years after that. So very early stages. And when they described Buriolestes, they thought that it was probably a sauropodomorph And they described it as the most basal sauropodomorph that had been found to date, which was interesting because it has sharp serrated teeth, which makes it look like a carnivore. And it kind of has an overall theropod-ish body plan, meaning it's on two legs. It's got shorter front arms. It's got the sharp teeth, kind of a more narrow skull and all, all the kind of stuff you look at and you think, oh, that looks kind of like a theropod. Didn't sauropodomorphs all kind of look like that, though? No, sauropodomorphs include... Later sauropods, they also include the oh, like right. semi-bipedal, quadrupedal guys. But the earliest ones, they do now think, looked like this. They had the sharp teeth and were bipedal and all that good stuff. So this also led a little bit more credence to the theory that maybe all dinosaurs started out as quick bipedal carnivores, and then later some of them diverged into being herbivorous. So yeah, that's... A pretty interesting dinosaur for that reason. And it was also pretty small. It was only about two meters or six feet long, which is really tiny for a sauropodomorph thing, you know, because that includes titanosaurs. Yeah. (laughs) When you think of it that way. All that kind of stuff. You have a pretty small ancestor. And this one is also in Brazil, which was where the original one was also found. 
This specimen is named CAPPA UFSM 0035 after the University of Santa Maria and its museum, which are in Brazil and right by where the dinosaur was found. It's really well preserved. It's basically the full skull through the hips. So if you imagine that sort of chunk of a dinosaur with the ribs, a good chunk of the back and all that, it doesn't have the tail, it doesn't have the hands or the feet or most of the legs. But fortunately, the original, the holotype, which was found back in 2016, had the tail, it had a full limb, a rear limb, and it also had part of a forelimb. Ah, so when you put them together. Exactly. When you put them together, you get almost the entire dinosaur. It's pretty great. When they did their analysis on the cladogram, you know, trying to figure out where this fit in the dinosaur family tree, now that we have more information about it, they think that Burialestes still is a sauropodomorph. And they also stuck in Eoraptor in the sauropodomorph group. It looked like it kind of pulled into the group. There's been a lot of back and forth about whether or not Eoraptor is a sauropodomorph or if it's just some sort of other basal sauriscian dinosaur. It's like right on that sort of transitional spot where you're like, you know, kind of like Archaeopteryx where you're like, is it a dinosaur? Is it a bird? It's right. It's both. It's kind of in between, <laughs> you know, like it just depends on how you write your definition of one or the other. So Eoraptor is on there, but in this paper, they decided that it was probably a sauropodomorph and it actually becomes the basalmost sauropodomorph usurping <laughs> Burialestes position as the basalmost sauropodomorph when it gets put into that group. They also proposed an alternative that maybe Eoraptor and Burialestes, and as well as a couple of other dinosaurs, are in their own group, which didn't evolve into later sauropodomorphs. So they're saying this is sort of a different branch of the evolutionary family tree that dead ended. You know, just like all the dinosaurs that aren't theropods didn't evolve into birds, they're saying this group of sauropodomorphs or sauriscians didn't evolve into later sauropodomorphs. It just didn't work out for them. Exactly. Which would be interesting, and it would make you kind of wonder again back about, like, were some of them originally herbivorous? Did they all come from the same common ancestor and all that kind of stuff? One thing that I found really interesting, because whenever I see papers about early dinosaurs now, I look at how they construct their phylogeny, and there was no mention of Ornithocelida anywhere in the paper. It's not widely accepted yet. It is not, but sometimes in these newer papers, when they're talking about the different dinosaur groups, they do Ornithischia, Sauropodomorpha, and Theropoda, the latter two in Saurischia, and other times they kind of try alternates that work with the Ornithoscelida or Ornithocelida grouping, but this paper didn't. So one more, I guess, group in the camp of sticking to the old dinosaur names, <laughs> nomenclature. <laughs> this will probably happen for a long time. Yeah, and I think we need a lot more early dinosaur finds before we can really nail it down. And this guy might not even be early enough, because even though we're talking in the Triassic we got to go back a little farther, probably, to really nail it down how they evolved. Up next, we've got a paper about some new tracks that have been digitized. I always enjoy when this happens. So basically, there are six different sites in Coahuila, Mexico, and Jose Gudinho Mausan and others published a paper where they talk about how they digitized all these prints. And it was interesting to me because I went into a lot more detail about the actual digitizing of the prints than I usually oh, see really? in these photogrammetry sort of papers. So they, I bet you liked that. I did. Yeah. <laughs> they say that they used 10 different cameras. They had a little list of all the cameras and the models and everything. And they were mostly just <laughs> cheap point and shoot cameras. And they were also mostly older cameras. So maybe they actually did these pictures a little while ago because most of the cameras are a couple years old at this point. And there were a couple of mid-range C style digital SLRs, which, you know, were maybe in the $500 sort of price point, but they didn't have any sort of professional grade photography equipment. And they specifically even say in the paper that they needed a high resolution, and by that they meant 5 to 10 megapixels, but they didn't need professional cameras to do photogrammetry. And really, if you only need 5 to 10 megapixels, you could do that with just about any 
modern cell phone. <laughs> oh. I'm wondering if we're going to start seeing photogrammetry papers that use like iPhones. <laughs> That'd be cool or, and way easier to use. It would be, yeah. And carry. I guess the problem might be, I don't know if they need to shoot raw. I don't think they do because I don't think most of those cameras shoot in raw. I think JPEGs probably work. So yeah, we might start seeing that. It'd be interesting. They also say they took about 50 pictures of each track or section so for these larger areas, because there were six different sites, some of them had over 100 prints, and then they would section off three by three meter areas or about 10 by 10 foot areas for photographing. And then, yeah, it took about 50 pictures, I guess, from different angles. They said that there's no real rule for how many pictures to take, and they just kind of shot for about 50 to 60 was sort of their goal for each little area. I think theoretically you could probably get it done in as few as two or three, but... You want to make sure. Yeah, you want to make sure you're getting all the angles and all the detail and stuff. But then they said after you go through a certain number of pictures, it ends up just bogging down the processing and taking a lot longer and it doesn't give you any more detail. So they didn't want to overdo it, but maybe they should have taken a few more. I'm not sure. They said that they took 11,840 photographs and then they used 4,960, so a little less than half. And then they generated 72 different three-dimensional textured polygonal mesh models for the different localities. So that's quite a few. But they said that they had better results from the smaller track sites. And they think that's because they had more pictures that were taken and they also had better contrast. So I kind of wanted to see too if that was with some of the better cameras, if they were getting better contrast or if... It was the other way around or, you know, there was no correlation, but they didn't go into any of that detail. So you wanted even more I detail did. on the I process. Did. Yeah, I really did. <laughs> <laughs> it probably wasn't dependent on the camera because they specifically said that it didn't matter. So th I'm sure they checked for that. But it's interesting to use 10 different cameras. Though. That's a lot of cameras. My guess is they just had 10 people there. So they had 10 people with 10 cameras and they all walked around taking tons of pictures and then combined them all. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it seemed like to me at least. So, anywho, they've got a new digitized version of these prints, which is good because they're starting to erode. So it's always great to digitize them because then you have them forever. You can go back and look at them hundreds of years later. It sure would be nice if we had a digitized version of the original Spinosaurus material that was destroyed. Or maybe that potentially dubious, what's it called, Amphicelius? The fragile, huge vertebrae that was probably an error in note-taking. <laughs> but if there was a 3D model of that from photogrammetry, you'd trust it a lot better. Yeah, that's true. So there we go. There's pretty much no excuse not to do photogrammetry. You could probably do it with a smartphone at this point. Does that make you want to do photogrammetry? Yes. <laughs> Sometimes when I see something somewhere, like in a museum, I wonder if I could sneak around this fossil from enough angles and take enough pictures to make a 3D model of it. <laughs> it would probably be frowned upon, though. Probably. <laughs> and up next, thanks to Chris for sharing this with us on Twitter, we've got a paper about incubation behavior by Kohei Tanaka and others, and published in Biology Letters. And basically what they were looking at was the problem of how dinosaurs might have been too heavy to contact incubate their eggs, which we actually talked about really recently. There was a study looking at the amount of weight that an egg could support. And by the estimates of the size of the egg and the size of the dinosaur, they thought that a lot of the eggs couldn't support the weight of a dinosaur. So they would get crushed if the dinosaur tried to contact incubate it with the assumption that the way you contact incubate an egg is by sitting on it, because that's basically what modern birds do. They just sit right down on the egg and then the warmth of their body keeps the egg warm. But the way these authors are saying that that isn't a problem anymore is essentially they looked at all these different nests of different dinosaurs, and they found that larger dinosaurs leave a space in the middle of the nest for them to lay down in. <laughs> oh, so it's just the heat from their body gets yeah. to the eggs? Well, so they have a ring of eggs around the nest, and then they have part of their body sort of overlapping that. And, you know, they have feathers, too. So the feathers can kind of poof out a little bit, too. And so, like, the edge of their body is contact incubating them. But they're not putting the weight of their body onto them. 
the feet and everything are right underneath them. They kind of plop down in the middle, and then they got the ring of eggs around them, sucking the warmth out of them. <laughs> <laughs> and then they also looked at various sizes of nests, and they saw that smaller dinosaurs left little to no space in the middle of the nest. And those are ones where we think that the eggs were probably strong enough to support the animal, so they could just plop right down on them and didn't have to worry about doing any kind of fancy extra large nest where they have space for their own body. For some of these ones with the largest dinosaurs, the nest is like 80% just space for the adult to plop down in <laughs> with a little ring of eggs around the edge, like a single row in a big circle. So it's a pretty large nest. Yeah. It's a large nest, but it's for the parent, <laughs> not for the babies. <laughs> so the authors summarize this by saying, this adaptation not seen in birds appears to remove the body size constraints of incubation behavior in giant oviraptorosaurs. So even something like Gigantoraptor could probably plop down all over a ton of it <laughs> and contact incubate just by contacting sort of its side rather than sitting down directly on it. And when I was reading that, I was thinking, well, that's kind of, it seems obvious in retrospect because you have things like emperor penguins that contact incubate their eggs, but they don't do it by standing or sitting on their eggs. They put the egg on their feet yeah. and then they just kind of have a fold of skin and feathers that goes over the egg and keeps it warm. So there's a lot of different ways to keep an egg warm without having to physically put all of your weight on it. The weight isn't what keeps it warm. It's just the contact. It's like, if you're sitting next to somebody and you're touching up next to them and it's a really hot day, you feel the warmth <laughs> of the person next to you. They don't have to be sitting on your lap necessarily, although that might make you more warm because there's more contact. <laughs> but any amount of contact can transmit the heat. So, yep, makes sense to me. It was a warm day today. It was. That's why Garrett's thinking of that. Taiwan is too hot. <laughs> That's what I've learned so far on nah, this trip. It's fine. It's good. <laughs> In another part of the world, we've got an update on the theropod skeleton going on auction in Paris in June. So the Guardian reported that whoever wins the auction might have the opportunity to name the species. Just reminding you, the theropod is 70% complete. At first it was thought to be an Allosaurus, but then in 2016, scientists analyzed the bones and found that it had too many differences. Professor Eric Mickler, who's overseeing the sale, said that if the skeleton's confirmed to be a new species, then the new owner may have a chance to name it, but that depends on peer review and, quote, meeting a range of rather strict protocols, which I don't know exactly what those protocols are, but... I think they're just referring generally to the sort of peer review process and the fact that it'll have to be really well documented, mm, and some people sense. don't like that with their fossils, so, yeah. Yeah. So this skeleton, they're expecting it's going to sell for 1.2 million euros, and a lot of people are hoping that it'll go on public display. I'm one of those people. Yeah, me too. It's interesting because we saw some people who were really upset about this and saying like it's a new bad sign for paleontology that you're kind of auctioning off the rights for science and things like that. But we'll have to see how it goes because... It could potentially be that someone really just wants the dinosaur named after them and is willing to shell out a bunch of money to like put their name on it. And that is actually done now and then like intentionally. People sometimes auction off dinosaur naming rights to fund some of the excavation or preparation work. And sometimes it's done intentionally like by agreement and other times it's done as a thank you. Like somebody donates a bunch of money and they happen to find a new dinosaur and then they name it after them. I guess the difference is in those cases, you know that it's going to be available for research or put on display or something. Yeah, I think that is the main difference because in this case, it might still end up in a private collection. But most museums that I know of and most researchers won't name something and won't research something that's in a private collection. They want to get it donated first. So whether or not they can even find somebody willing to work on this specimen in a private collection is another question. So uh, we'll have to see how it goes. It could be good. It could be bad. It could be in between. <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably be in between. <laughs> Make some people happy, other people upset. <laughs> Next, we're a little late with this one, but back on Mother's Day earlier this month, Google Doodle celebrated by sharing a dinosaur doodle, which is pretty cute. It looked like uh, one of those when kids do handprint kind of art. It was of two stegosaurus 
There was one that was green and had four handprints for spikes, and then a smaller yellow one with two handprints. It's supposed to be a mother and a baby. Aw. Yeah, really cute. Made me want to make my own art. <laughs> I'll just jot that down for future children drawings. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, happy belated Mother's Day. Next, we got more details on the Patagotitan Mayorum Titanosaur skeleton replica that's coming to the Field Museum in Chicago. The dinosaur's name is Maximo, which is the Spanish word for maximum, and that refers to where the skeleton was found in Argentina. I see. Yeah. Maximo will debut on June 1st, though visitors can see the skeleton being installed from May 23rd to 25th. It's interesting that they're naming a replica of a dinosaur. I don't think I've ever heard of that before. Sure. There's lots of dinosaur replicas or casts or skeletons even that have nicknames. Oh, I guess like Dippy? Yeah. I can't think of any other ones. Oh, uh, there's, uh, I want to say Trixie, the Triceratops, you've got... I thought that was an original, though. Oh, And then there's maybe. like Stan, Sue is an original. But I guess since there's Dippy, there is a precedent there. I think they probably wanted to do it because they have Sue. So then what are you going to call this other new dinosaur? Oh, yeah. There you go. Sue needs a friend. Yeah. And I guess it's Maximo. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of dinosaur exhibits... The National Museum in Rio de Janeiro is crowdfunding in order to restore their Maxicalisaurus, which I think I'm saying right. It sounds kind of like Maximo, actually. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> and it's also a sauropodomorph, and it's their biggest dinosaur skeleton. They say that it's turning 20 years old this year. Actually, in the reporting, they said it was turning 200, but... I had to look that up because I was thinking, wait, if this dinosaur mount is 200 years old, it's by far the oldest dinosaur mount ever by like an order of magnitude. Ah, uh, true. <laughs> by like 100 years at least. But no, they, it was a typo because it, was it wasn't described until 1996. So it's definitely 20 years old. The problem is last year termites destroyed the base of the mount. Oh. So it needs some restoration and they're hoping to raise $30,000 by June for the restoration. And if you're wondering what the largest dinosaur at this National Museum is, it's about 13 meters or 43 feet long. That's pretty large. So it's no Maximo, but it's still pretty big. Hopefully they get the money so they can restore it. It's a pretty cool looking museum. I added it to our dinosaur map. Yeah, you've added a bunch. Yeah, I was getting behind. <laughs> <laughs> Got a number of museum exhibits to talk about. So the next one is the Flint Hills Discovery Center in Manhattan, Kansas. They have a new exhibit called Be the Dinosaur, and from now until September 3rd, visitors can use VR to play a game as either a T-Rex or a Triceratops and then see how they lived, and you have to try to stay alive by eating, drinking, avoiding predators, defending yourself. You don't get to choose if you're T-Rex or Triceratops, it sounds like. It's kind of random, but the game lasts six to seven minutes unless your dinosaur dies. And there's also more information about dinosaurs throughout the exhibit and a T-Rex wall puzzle, a puppet theater, and a dig pit for finding fossils. Cool. Yeah, it actually reminded me a little bit of Saurian. Oh, interesting. Because, well, I didn't see it, but just based on this description, because you're playing as a dinosaur, right? And you have to stay alive, except you're in VR and it's a much shorter game. Yeah. Well, Saurian is going to be in VR at some point, apparently. Six to seven minutes is a long time. I've never played one of those interactive dinosaur things in a museum that lasted that long. It seems like usually they're 30 seconds to a minute kind of thing. Actually, usually they glitch on me because I'm too tall and they're expecting children. <laughs> but if I can crouch down and get them to work, <laughs> then they last about a minute. Well, who knows how many people can last the full game. <laughs> oh, good point. Yeah. It's like if you beat the entire game of Pac-Man, it lasts <laughs> X number of minutes, but nobody ever makes it that far. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Next, the Traveling Dinosaur Exhibition Dino Trek will have a permanent home at Kuching Civic Center in Malaysia starting at the end of next year. So the exhibit first opened in 2003 and it's been traveling all over. They've got nine animatronic dinosaurs, 12 interactive exhibits, and hands-on activities. And dinosaurs in the exhibit include Myasaura, the eggs, Protoceratops, and Velociraptor, and T-Rex. Nice. That's a pretty good number of exhibits. 12 interactive exhibits? Yeah, although I couldn't find details on what you do with them. But. Yeah, that could be small, I guess. Next, it turns out that Charles Dickens was a science enthusiast, which I never really thought about before because I only think about his novels. Yeah, I don't really like them. Oh, well, anyway, until recently, people thought that 
Dickens either wasn't interested in science or he was even possibly hostile to it. But a new exhibition at the Charles Dickens Museum in London shows that, no, he wasn't. So the curator, Frankie Kubicki, said, quote, That is a misunderstanding and a travesty. <laughs> <laughs> he was one of the most influential scientific communicators of the Victorian age, end quote. Apparently, Dickens took a lot of trips, and he tried to reveal the claims of spiritualists to show oh, nice. they didn't know what they were talking about. And he also, the ex exhibit shows a collection of sketches and notes where Dickens speculated about the inferences scientists make about extinct creatures from the remains they left behind, as well as what future generations would deduce about his society. Oh, that's really cool. Does that make you like him more? It does. Yeah. And... He also speculated whether or not they'd be able to use ancient remains to sense, quote, the existence of the polished state of society that bore with the public savagery of neglected children in the streets and never used its power to seize and save them, quote. So he wow. wanted a better society. Yeah. Yeah. And on a dinosaur note, and we've actually mentioned this before, Dickens wrote about Megalosaurus in the opening paragraph of his novel Bleak House, where he described, quote, a megalosaurus, 40 feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill. That's funny. Very Crystal Palace Park sort of dinosaur depiction, which I guess is... It's around the same time. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that makes me like Charles Dickens a lot more. <laughs> I didn't really have any reason to like him before. <laughs> now you do. Yeah. In other news, in Dixon, California, the Dixie dinosaur guess where it got its name, that had been a landmark at one of the gas stations is now gone. And there's an article talking about where it went. So the dinosaur, it was 50 feet tall, it weighed 15,000 pounds, and it was made of fiberglass. And you could, Jeez. yeah, you could see it from the freeway because it was so big. It wasn't permitted, though, so there was a lot of controversy. And then one day the owner flew it out in a helicopter and it moved to a few different places. And now Dixie is in a field in Fairfield, cut up into five pieces so that eventually it can be fixed up and eventually put back together and put on display somewhere else, probably with permits. <laughs> I see. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Moving into media news, there's this cute video of a young boy at a dinosaur theme park in China, and the boy is clearly very scared of the animatronic carnivore that's behind him. <laughs> he looks very unhappy. But then his parents ask him to smile, and he smiles really wide, like very fake. And so some people on social media are saying his performance is, quote, Oscar worthy. Because <laughs> he was able to do it on cue. <laughs> That's really funny. It's just terrified, and then just switches to smiling. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> now we have a few Jurassic World pieces of news. I'll let you know if there's spoilers. Don't worry, Garrett. This first one. No spoilers, but Universal Studios Hollywood's going to have a new Jurassic World attraction next year. There's not too much information yet that I could find, but the website says, quote, Journey to where living dinosaurs roam the Earth in the part expedition, part heart-pounding water ride based on the blockbuster film franchise and plan to experience the original Jurassic Park the ride one final time before it becomes extinct on September 3rd, 2018. So it sounds like they are replacing the Jurassic Park ride. Yeah. That's kind of sad. I really like that ride. I never went in on it. I don't like drops. <laughs> there's some really cool dinosaurs. Although there's like a T-Rex that kind of jumps out at you right when you're dropping. I think I read somewhere, I want to say Steven Spielberg, when the ride first came out, he was on the ride and then he asked to stop right before the drop so he could get off. Really? <laughs> I think it was him. It was somebody who was involved in the movie. Oh, that's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's enough. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that ride's great. I heard somebody saying, I think on social media somewhere, that they hope they don't replace all the animatronics with videos because apparently they've done that on a couple rides recently. Oh, the animatronics are great. They really are. And they hold up pretty well, the ones on that ride especially. So hopefully they just like add an Indominus Rex or like some other dinosaurs maybe from Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom and sort of update it with new dinosaurs from the franchise rather than just replacing it outright with other screens and things like that. Kind of like what Disney did with Pirates of the Caribbean. They add the characters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In Jurassic World game news, IGN released a new gameplay video of Jurassic World Evolution. And in it, you got Jeff Goldblum, who does some narration. In the game, you can choose to focus on entertainment, science, or security. I think you do that by choosing a character. And you work your way up to tougher missions. 
You can also upgrade your facilities, expand your park, make improvements to your dinosaurs by giving them things like longer lifespans or make them more easygoing. Mm -hmm. And the first four dinosaurs you can add to your park are Struthiomimus, Edmontosaurus, Ceratosaurus, and Triceratops. Cool. Yeah. I really want to play that game. Well, yeah, there's a whole list of other known dinosaurs in the game. They include Ankylosaurus, Apatosaurus, Brachiosaurus, Indominus Rex, Metriacanthosaurus, Spinosaurus, Stegosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, and Velociraptor. And we'll post a link so you can see the full list. They're also, I think, adding to it as they learn more. Yeah, the, I know they keep releasing little videos of the different dinosaurs. And they're all very Jurassic Parky. So don't expect realism out of this game. There are other similar park builder games coming out that do have realistic dinosaurs, if that's more your cup of tea. But I expect this one at least to be like really fun with lots of sort of quests and missions and things like that, whether or not the dinosaurs are perfect. Well, yeah, I doubt they'd be perfect. Anyway, you can make improvements to them. <laughs> it, it fits with the whole genetic engineering thing for sure. Yeah. Last, we've got a little bit more news about Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. This one has the spoilers. Spoiler alert. Yes. So <laughs> fast forward through this part if you don't want to hear any spoilers. But Universal Pictures released a featurette of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. It's a really short video and explains how there's a gothic element to this film. The movie is going to take place a few years after the first Jurassic World. And at first, it seems like the other movies. You've got Owen and Claire and a team, and they need to go save the dinosaurs from their island before it quote-unquote explodes. It's that <laughs> volcanic eruption we keep seeing in the trailers. That's what islands do. They explode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that line was pretty funny. And they find Blue, the Velociraptor, but it turns out that the team Owen and Claire are with are double-crossers, and they capture Blue and other dinosaurs, including Indoraptor, the new villainous Gasp. dinosaur. Yeah, and they auction them off. And then in this movie... We know that Owen and Blue have a special relationship, but they kind of delve more into it and why they have such a special relationship, which I guess we could guess because we saw that quick clip of Owen with Blue, the baby velociraptor. So Yeah, and like scratching under the chin and all that. Yeah. The dinosaurs, they end up loose on the mainland, like in Jurassic Part 2, but the twist is that there's no island to return them to because, mm -hmm. you know, the island explodes. Yeah, so what are they going to do with them? Well, MovieWeb theorizes that Jurassic World 3 could be like Planet of the Apes. Where dinosaurs have taken over the whole world? Something. Something like that, yeah. So that'll that be, be interesting. Cool. Yeah. Anyway, the featurette, there's a lot of great scenes with dinosaurs. So if you want to get a glimpse before the movie comes out. Cool. Yeah, that's really interesting. Interesting stuff. I guess I shouldn't have been too harsh about the island exploding because Krakatoa basically did completely explode the island. If it's a violent enough eruption, it could pretty much blow away the whole island. There you go. But it didn't look like that's what was happening in the trailer. It looked more like a typical sort of The trailer eruption. is only showing the beginning of the eruption. So maybe we see an explosion later. Yeah, that's true. I'm not a volcanism expert, so I don't know if you can have both types of eruption at once. Maybe. I suppose. Also, it's sci-fi. Yeah, true. It's a genetically engineered volcano. It acts differently. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and speaking of Jurassic Park, we want to pause to take a word from our sponsor, TRX Dinosaurs, who make all sorts of puppets, sculptures, and animatronics. And I was thinking it would be cool to have a sort of baby blue puppet like is in the movie, in that scene you're talking about where you oh, scratch yeah. under its chin. Oh, yeah. That would be cute. Yeah. And TRX Dinosaurs could make one for you. They could also make maybe a blue Utah raptor sculpture if you wanted something that was sort of scientifically accurate but themed around Jurassic Park. You get like blue feathers or something oh, yeah. on a big Utah raptor. Well, they're also selling a Utah raptor head right now. Oh, yes, because they're moving house, so they need to get rid of some stuff. So if you're listening to this right when it comes out, the bust will still be on eBay for at least a couple more hours. So you can go there and bid on it and get your very own Utah Raptor bust. Or you can go to trxdinosaurs.com and order whatever other kind of dinosaur you might like. And then, of course, we have our Velociraptor giveaway. This is the regular one-to-one -one scale realistic Velociraptor, not Jurassic Park-style Velociraptor, <laughs> <laughs> which fills up a whole room. <laughs> and you can win it by clicking the link in our show notes. 
And this week's link to enter and win, potentially, is bit.ly slash winme182. So if you're familiar with bit.ly, bit.ly slash winme182. And just the legalese mumbo jumbo. The sweepstakes is open to the residents of the U.S. and Canada, except Quebec and where prohibited. There's no purchase necessary, one entry per household per episode, complete rules on our website. And you can also get the link to enter from our show notes. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Monolophosaurus, which appears in the Jurassic World game as well as toys. Cool. <laughs> so it appears in Jurassic Park 3, the park builder game, as well as Jurassic World, the game. It wasn't originally in that game, but it was added in August 2015, and you can unlock it in the level 55 battle area. Jurassic World, the game. Oh, that's that iPad game where you like get all the dinosaurs in your park. That must be the one. If it's the level 55 battle area. I think I remember you battling in different levels, right? I think there's a few of those types of games, but yeah. I think that's the one. Yeah. It's also going to be in the game Jurassic World Alive. Cool. So many games. I guess I'm going to have to get that game too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Monolophosaurus was a tetanurin theropod that lived in the Jurassic in what is now Xinjiang, China, in the Shishogo Formation. The type species, and only species, is Monolophosaurus jiangai, and they found a nearly complete skeleton back in 1981 on a Canadian-Chinese expedition. It took three years to excavate. Oof. Yeah. It was referred in the media in 1987 as Jianjunmiaosaurus before it was officially described, and that was an invalid nomum nudum, which is a naked name. Yeah, because it wasn't associated with a real description, just sort of thrown out there. <laughs> yeah. Dong Xingming mentioned it as Monolophosaurus Jiangjun Miaoi in 1992, and Wayne Grady mentioned it as Monolophosaurus Dongai in 1993, but there was no description, so these are also nomen nuda. It was officially described in 1993-1994 by Zhao Shijing and Philip Curry and named Monolophosaurus jiangai. The genus name means single crested lizard. It had one crest on top of its skull. As opposed to Dilophosaurus, which means two crested lizard. Yep. <laughs> and the species name refers to Jiangju Miao, which is an abandoned desert inn near where the specimen was found. And it means the Temple of the General, and there's a local legend that a general was buried there. The holotype consists of a skull, lower jaws, vertebral column, and pelvis, and it's either of an adult or subadult. It was about 16.4 feet or 5 meters long and weighed 1,500 pounds or 680 kilograms, though Gregory Paul estimated in 2010 that it was about 18 feet or 5.5 meters and weighed about 1,050 pounds or about 475 kilograms. The type specimen was restored with plaster so that it could be part of a traveling exhibit, and the left side, unfortunately, is now in foam, which has made additional examination of the fossil kind of difficult. Steve Brousset published two studies in 2010, though redescribing the holotype, which was still the only known specimen at the time. So as I mentioned, it had one crest on top of its head, and this crest was hollow to save weight and may have been for display. The crest runs from the tip of the snout, the premaxilla, to over the nasal and towards the eyes, about three quarters the skull length, and it's largely formed by nasal bones. It has a broad base and narrow top with a flat upper surface. The nasal bone had a lot of holes with large air chambers, and the nasal crest was rough with a lot of bosses. So a very different crest than you see on Dilophosaurus. <laughs> yes, definitely. It also had a smaller horn behind the eye socket. It's not clear how long... Monolophosaurus's tail was because that wasn't found but the base of the tail faces slightly downwards and the type specimen had a pathology the 10th and 11th neural spines were fractured and fused together so Thomas Carr suggested in 2006 that Guanlong which is a theropod from the same formation with a crest was actually a subadult Monolophosaurus and in 2010 Gregory Paul renamed Guanlong as a second species of Monolophosaurus Monolophosaurus wutsai but in 2010, Stephen Brousset rejected this and said that the Guanlong holotype was an adult, not a subadult. Originally, Monolophosaurus was thought to be a megalosaur and was often thought to be an allosauroid, though now it's thought to be titanurin. And it was thought to be most closely related to Tuan Dongosaurus, another titanurin that lived in the Jurassic in China. And just as a quick reminder, titanurins are stiff-tailed theropods. They have straight tails that have a series of tendons. And our fun fact of the day 
comes from a recent article, which will become clear why it's a fun fact in a moment. <laughs> it was published in Copia by Agata Stanowicz and others. And basically what they found was that some crocodiles can change color or crocodilians. So it's been known apparently for a while, I did not know this, that certain crocodiles can develop their coloration to match the water that they live in. Oh. So say they're born in like murkier water, then they're darker or something like that. It's pretty crazy. So that's a certain type of color changing behavior, but that's sort of a long-term color changing. This recent study shows a really short-term color changing behavior using wild and captive Sunda gharials. And gharials are similar to alligators and crocodiles you're probably familiar with, except they have really long, narrow snouts, more like a spinosaurus, for example. Specifically, what they found was what they termed rapid ventral color changing in juveniles. And they say that basically, as the animals get older, they couldn't change their color as quickly. But the experiment's kind of fun. What they did is they put these gharials into tanks, and then they blasted some of them with a bunch of light and then those ones would get lighter on the bottom <laughs> than the ones that didn't. They repeated it a bunch of ways and mixed them all around. And it was pretty consistent that if they put a bunch of light on the top of them, then their bottom scales would lighten up. Interesting. Yeah. So kind of like a chameleon. Yeah, sort of. And they think it's probably sort of a counter shading. So if it's a bright day out and you're trying to blend in with the bright, you know, something looking at you from below, say like a fish or something, then you want your bottom to be lighter so that it kind of matches the sky mm -hmm. or from the side or, you know, really any direction for that matter. You want to shift your color a little bit. So apparently this is the first time this has been documented in a crocodilian, a sort of fast changing color shift. And it's interesting, it doesn't happen as much with older adults, but still possible with the young ones. So that's pretty cool. It's a young animals game. <laughs> yeah. They say that it didn't happen with adults, but their data looked like all of them could do it to some extent. And I think they were basically only using juveniles. So I think that if they really want to say that, they probably need to test with some older ones just to replicate it. It's obviously a lot harder to test this kind of thing on a full-sized crocodilian <laughs> yeah. than it is on a baby where you can That's throw true. in a tank and, you know, flip over and all that kind of stuff. Because they have pictures of them and they're basically just holding their mouth shut with one hand kind of thing. If you've got like a full-grown crocodile, it's a little trickier. But pretty interesting. And it made me think that this is more evidence that we might have seen some sort of color changing behavior in different dinosaurs. For example, like the Carnotaurus, which was in Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah. At least in the book. Well, I was just thinking flamingos kind of do this too, right? The more shrimp they eat, the pinker they get. Yeah, but that's the long term version again. Oh, I see. So this is talking like within an hour, they can switch back and forth. Right. Sort of time scale. And they think it's probably for camouflage, although it potentially could also be for communication or thermoregulation. But they tried to control for all the variables, and it looked like they were only responding to the light. So pretty cool. It is. Yeah. I really hope that somehow we could find that a dinosaur, a non-avian dinosaur, could change its color based on its mood or something like that. That would just be awesome. That would be. <laughs> And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to us so that you don't miss out on any new episodes. Also check out our show notes so that you can enter the Velociraptor giveaway. And join us on Patreon if you want premium content about the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Lots going on. But thanks again and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.